Hello and welcome to this video on RSEM's causal models. My name is Christian Geiser, I'm an instructor with QuantFish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials usually related to factor analysis, structural equation modeling, multi-level analysis or latent class analysis. If this is something that interests you, please consider subscribing to this channel. Also in the description you find additional resources including workshops that I offer through QuantFish. In this video, I want to address a question that many people have who work with structural equation models, and that is, are structural equation models causal models? This is a frequent source of confusion, and so I want to shed more light on this issue here. So let's get started. In this simple example here, you can see a latent regression model with two factors where the factor F1 is used to predict the factor F2 and so an arrow points from F1 to F2 indicating a regression of the factor F2 on the factor F1 in the structural model. And so many people or in many situations we would like to interpret a path like that in terms of a causal effect, meaning in this example F1 would be seen as the cause of the factor F2. And now the question is, are we allowed to interpret our structural equation model in this regard in terms of a causal model where we depict and test causal relationships between observed and or between latent variables. And so first of all, certainly it is the case that causal relationships are represented in structural equation models, including path analysis where we have only observed variables. So we do hypothesize causal relationships in these types of models like the model here where a researcher might hypothesize that F1 is the cause of F2. Now that being said though we can only falsify, st falsify structural equation models. So we can test our model, we can obtain tests of model fit such as a chi-square test of model fit and other fit statistics and those can be used to rule out incorrect models. So based on model fit we can say oh this model needs to be rejected because it has a significant chi-square for example and therefore this cannot be the correct model. There may be incorrect causal assumptions there, we may be missing effects or there may be other problems with the model and so we're able to rule out models provided we have enough statistical power for our tests of model fit. We are able to identify incorrect models and that can be helpful to learn about causal effects because then we may learn which types of causal effects maybe are incorrect or what assumptions about causal effects are wrong. So that's possible but then the next question obviously is can we prove a causal relationship that we hypothesize by obtaining a well-fitting model. So let's say for example we fit this model on the left hand side and in this model the factor F1 is hypothesized to be the cause of the factor F2 and now this model let's say fits well, it has a non-significant chi-square, it does not have to be rejected, then can we conclude that yes F1 is the cause of the factor F2 or not? In order to um, answer that question, so can we prove causality in SEM, it is useful to consider equivalent models. And I have a separate video on equivalent models where I talk about this issue in more detail in case you're interested, you can check out that video as well. Here I'm only going to show you a simple example of two equivalent models starting again with the same latent regression model that I showed you on the previous slide where F1 is hypothesized to cause F2 and so now if this model fits you may be happy and you may say okay great this model doesn't have to be rejected this proves that F1 causes F2 and now I can come and I can say give me your data and I'm gonna fit this model to the data and oh surprise this model fits the data equally well. It produces the exact same degrees of freedom as the model on the left hand side and it has the exact same chi-square value, the same p-value for the chi-square even though in the model on the right hand side I make the 
assumption that f2 causes f1. So now the causal direction is reversed and yet this model fits equally well. So if one model is fitting well or if one model does not have to be rejected then the other model also doesn't have to be rejected. So this shows us that model fit alone does not allow us to prove causality. Model fit is only useful to rule out incorrect models. So when a model doesn't fit, then we know something is wrong with the model. But when a model fits the data, then that does not prove at all that the causal assumptions in this model are correct. And that's so say easily shown by this issue of equivalent models for any model that you fit, you will find other models that are equivalent that make other causal assumptions or have a very different structure otherwise from your hypothesized model and yet they fit equally well or you could find models that fit better and make different causal assumptions. So model fit is not helpful to prove causality. That's an important point. Now then how can we prove causality? Can we prove causality at all? Or what are conditions under which we can be reasonably certain that a causal effect goes in one direction and not the other? For that, it is useful to learn about three conditions for causality. The first one is association. Association means that the independent variable or cause must be correlated with the dependent variable or effect or outcome variable. So there has to be a relationship, a correlation, an association between the independent variable and the dependent variable. Otherwise there could not be causality. If the independent variable and the dependent variable were uncorrelated, then no causality. So this is something that we can examine and test with structural equation modeling because our model, for example, on the previous slide did contain a coefficient that reflects the association between f1 and f2, namely the regression coefficient, beta. So beta is a measure of the linear association between f1 and f2, and in a standardized solution, you would get a standardized regression coefficient, which in case of a bivariate regression with just two variables is equal to the correlation. So you can test that, you can take a look at the standardized regression coefficient, or you can take a look at a correlation between F1 and F2 in a confirmatory factor model, and then you can test whether that correlation is different from zero. So this is a condition that can be tested with SEM. However, it is only a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition for causality, meaning that association or correlation alone is not enough to show causality. And you may have heard the very frequent phrase or the phrase that is frequently stated that says correlation is not equal to causality. And that's really true. So correlation is a prerequisite for causality, but it's not the same thing as causality. The fact that two things are correlated does not mean that one thing causes the other. So we have to have other conditions in place as well. And the second condition is temporal precedence, meaning that the independent variable or cause has to occur before the outcome or dependent variable. And that can be ensured with a longitudinal design. So you can have a repeated measure study where your F1, for example, is measured prior to F2 in the longitudinal design so that you can ensure that F1 is measured first before F2. So that would be another important condition and longitudinal designs can be implemented or can be analyzed with structural equation models with longitudinal SEM, longitudinal confirmatory factor analysis, for example, latent autoregressive models, latent autoregressive cross lag models, and uh, random intercept cross lag panel models, and growth curve models, all kinds of models are available for longitudinal data. I offer a workshop on longitudinal SEM for quantfish, for which you can find the link in the description and also there are videos on this channel that you can check out on longitudinal SEM as well. So SEM is well suited to analyze longitudinal designs as well. If you have only cross-sectional designs, meaning single time point data, 
then you can only look at the first condition, association. You can look at whether the variables are correlated, but that alone is a very, very weak indicator of causality. Then if you don't have temporal precedence also, that's very weak. And even temporal precedence alone is not enough. Also what needs to be shown for causality is isolation. Isolation means that there cannot be any other explanations for the independent variable with dependent variable relationship. What does that mean? That means that there could be third variables or additional variables, covariates as we say sometimes, that cause variation in both the independent variable and the dependent variable. So there may be confounders of the IVDV relationship or in other words the association or correlation between the independent variable and the dependent variable may be spurious. It may be due to a third variable that causes that relationship. And so therefore when that is the case, then temporal precedence also doesn't help you because if these other variables are not measured, if those confounders have not been measured, you may find a longitudinal association between the IV and the DV and yet that is not indicative of causality. How can you ensure isolation if it's not enough to have association and temporal precedence? So really isolation is most appropriately ensured by implementing a true experimental design. What does that mean? A true experimental design is one where you have random assignment of individuals to groups of the independent variable. For example, experimental conditions, treatment versus control, or um, an intervention group versus a control group, where individuals are randomly assigned to the treatment versus control groups and then you measure the dependent you manipulate so say you 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 have your intervention or manipulation and then you measure the the dependent variable that's an experimental design with random assignment why is this helpful to show isolation it's helpful because the random assignment of individuals ensures that on average, the participants will be equal on all those potential confounders. There will be no pre-existing differences on those variables um, for the participants that are assigned to one group or another because they are randomly assigned. And so that is a very, very strong way to ensure isolation. A weaker way to obtain isolation in designs or in situations where you cannot implement an experimental design is to measure the confounders. So if you know which variables may be potential confounders, potential covariates, third variables that may uh, provide alternative explanations for the IVDV relationship, you can assess those. You can measure them and then include them in your structural equation model as covariates in the same way as you would do this in an analysis of covariance or a regression analysis. And that is sometimes something that we have to do. That's our only option sometimes, because in many cases, we cannot manipulate the independent variable. There may be independent variables where you cannot have uh, manipulation and or you cannot have random assignment because it's unethical or otherwise impossible. You cannot, for example, assign individuals to gender groups. You cannot assign individuals to smoker versus non-smoker groups because it would be unethical to make people smoke. And so there are many situations where you cannot randomly assign people and or you cannot manipulate your independent variable for various reasons. And so in that case, you're only um, resort or your last resort, so to say, is to measure potential confounding variables. And that's very important then in the planning phase of your study that you think theoretically about what all could be potential confounding variables, covariates that may provide alternative explanations for the IVDV relationship, and then make sure you measure all of those. You include them in your measurement design and you make sure that they're reliably measured because or with multiple indicators. So you can later on correct for measurement error in your SEM because measurement error in an analysis of covariance can be bad for properly controlling for those covariates. So that's very important to have control, have control that there are no other explanations for the IV DV relationship. And then you can apply SEM. You can apply SEM to longitudinal designs. You can apply 
SEM to longitudinal experimental or quasi-experimental designs. You can have covariates that you can add in your model to control for those covariates. So that's all possible. And then your SEM becomes stronger in terms of um, being able to infer causal effects. Now, can it prove causal effects? Probably not, unless you have a true experimental design that is very strong, where the design, so to say, the design features um, allow you to claim causality. So it's really about the design rather than the model. The model is statistical in nature and it just models covariances or correlations. And as we know, covariances and correlations are not equal to causal effects necessarily. And the SEM is neutral towards how the correlations were obtained. So were they obtained by a causal effect or were they obtained in some other fashion, so to say. And so really the SEM itself cannot prove causality. It's about the design. It's about whether it's a longitudinal design. It's about whether it's an experimental design. It's about whether there's control of potential confounding variables because they're all added into the model. That is, so to say, what helps you with causality. So in summary, certainly causal effects are represented as hypotheses in structural equation models whether the effects can be interpreted as causal effects though is more a matter of the research design features than it is of the model fit of the sem we can certainly rule out incorrect models but we can never prove causality by model fit indices alone I hope you found this video useful to learn more about causality and structural equation modeling. Please consider subscribing to this channel and I see you next time.